Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please settle down. We are about to begin our program for this evening. I also request you all to put your smartphones on the silent board. The mark of respect to our distinguished panelists. I'm delighted to be back in this hall after a gap of several years. Once in the same very hall, we had Ambassador Maharaj Kishore Gotra, Ambassador Brijesh Mishra, Ambassador Lalit Man Singh, Ambassador Kamal Sibbal, Professor Amitabh Mattu, Dr. Kiran Karnik, Donald Lu, who is currently U.S. Assistant Secretary for this region. They were all in the same panel here. For this evening, we couldn't have found more distinguished and eminent panel. Ms. Arun K. Singh has not only been an eyewitness to the transformative changes in India's relations, but has been an active and important player in the evolutionary process. Besides being ambassador to USA, he has also served as India's ambassador to Israel and France, so he can look at bilateral relations from different prisms also. In General Deepak Kapoor, we have one of the most decorated generals who has been an excellent Northeast and Jammu and Kashmir. He has also served as chairman of Joint Chiefs Staff Committee. The expansion and deepening of U.S. relations in the sphere of defense security has been phenomenal. General Kapoor will enlighten us about the possible impact of this ongoing expanding cooperation if there is change of guard at the White House. Dr. Sujit Bhalla was India's executive director at the IMF till last year. He has also been a member of Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. He is a phenomenal writer. He writes quite often in papers, several books to his credit. The U.S. has emerged India's largest trading partner and a major supplier of defense equipment, oil, gas, and now cooperating in manufacturing semiconductors and ships. Dr. Valla will share his thoughts about the impact on the economic relations if Donald Trump returns to White House. Professor Chintamani Mahapatra has been professor of American, Canadian, and Latin American studies for decades, and he was rector of JNU till recently. He will try to throw some light why a country which has been in the forefront of innovation and game-changing new technologies should opt for two of the oldest candidates for presidential race, and why all the impeachments and pending court cases and his role in the insurrection at the Capitol haven't dimmed Donald Trump's appeal to millions of American voters. Lastly, Jorabar Dolat Singh, who is the youngest on the panel, who is an adjunct fellow at the Institute of Chinese Studies, has appeared in several of our discussions in the past, has written several seminal books. He will share his views about the likely impact of the change of guards at the White House on Sino-American relations and how it will influence U.S.-India relations. It is a well-known secret, the warmth and bonami in India-U.S. relations is directly proportionate to degree of restraint in U.S.-China relations. As for me, I personally foresee no drastic change in India-U.S. relations if there is a change of guard in the White House. PM Modi had interacted with three U.S. presidents, this first for any Indian prime minister, with totally different personalities, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden. <coughs> and has got along well with all three of them, developing personal chemistry, warmth, and bonami. We have reached a stage where we can air our differences maturely. Our purchase of Russian oil and refusal to condemn Russian invasion of Ukraine and buying as a 400 air defense system from Russia are the examples of this. There are other issues on which also we have differences, but we somehow manage them. We are cooperating in Quad, Indo-Pacific, I2U2. Most recently, U.S. came out strongly condemning Chinese comments about Arunachal Pradesh. So these relations are tipped to blossom. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a very distinguished panel, and they are the ones who will enlighten you. So we will begin with Dr. Jorava Dolat Singh. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, I must also say this is I have already written to you. You have 10 minutes each. Eight minutes first buzzer means two minutes left. Second buzzer, 10 minutes. That means your time is up. No problem. So I'm, I'm going to sort of uh, locate uh, my brief remarks in a sort of historical context. Uh, and what we see is a rapidly changing world order. Uh, so the effort to build a durable partnership uh, with the U.S. has been a cornerstone of India's foreign policy since the late 90s. Uh, as the unipolar world unfolded, Indian policymakers across party lines quickly adopted a bipartisan consensus on the expectation of developing a broad-based relationship with the U.S. 
The high noon, as you will recall, was the mid-2000s, uh, where both countries seemed to converge on a grand strategic understanding <clears throat> on the long-term future of the partnership, as well as defining the pillars on what would sustain this uh, relationship into the 21st century. There were three pillars, uh, if you look back, a geopolitical dimension with respect to Asian security and China's rise, uh, a geoeconomic dimension with respect to the economy and globalization, and a world order perspective with, with respect to a sustainable world order, which it was envisaged would be led by the US, and India was sort of being primed or, in a sense, poised to play a, 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 a pivotal role in sustaining that unipolar order. That's, that's the uh, if you recall the debates and the conversations at the time, that was the essence. Uh, and and uh, even though there were uh, lots of contestations, I think an Indian consensus was formed in the early 2010s that the keys to India's great power status and ambitions held were held uh, closely by what kind of relationship India could build with the US. Uh, I'm going to now juxtapose as India is developing this consensus, we are seeing a tumultuous domestic politics unfold in the United States. This is actually ironical because the US system, which had handled extraordinary domestic stresses like the civil rights movement, uh, the costly Vietnam War, the hollowing out of its economic system, the manufacturing capabilities over the last four or five decades, seem to be reaching a tipping point where the bipartisan consensus and popular support for uh, America's role in the world could no longer be taken for granted by the uh, US establishment elites. Much of this crisis can be attributed now, uh, and it was even evident soon by the end of 2008-2009, on the wasteful military interventions right from the 1990s. Uh, the global economic crisis further seemed to suggest that the power advantage that the United States had on the non-Western world was greatly eroded. Uh, Trump 1.0 was a major uh, sign of a populist revolt within America uh, and an intended retrenchment in expensive uh, US security commitments across the world. Uh, this was dramatically interrupted, as we know, then in 2020-21 with the return of what was well seen as an establishment candidate and he returned to uh, the older policy framework. Uh, we are now sort of moving into what does it mean, this latest political flux. Uh, the underlying cracks in the US edifice, from my perspective and, and many others, seems unresolved and have actually grown wider in the last four years or eight years. Uh, in essence, how do we sort of make sense of what is this domestic crisis in the United States? I think it's an it's an ideological crisis of ideas, of culture, and international identity. Uh, very briefly, uh, we have competing ideas in the United States on what it would take the US to recover a state of sustainable progress and middle class prosperity. We don't have a, a, an agreed pathway. You have the nationalists and the globalists, each with a very different antithetical vision on what it would take. Uh, we also have culture wars in the United States on what it means to be an American today. And, and this idea of what will keep the fabric of what is obviously a multi-ethnic, multi-racial society uh, from tearing itself apart. And then finally we have, which impacts India directly, a crisis in, in America's international identity and role in an increasingly diverse, plural, multipolar world. Uh, neither side in US domestic politics has offered a compelling vision that can address these three aspects which are at the heart of the US political crisis or churning. Uh, a transformed America in the context of a rapidly changing world order has now created new circumstances for India, and I would argue uh, almost as radical as the outbreak of the Cold War and the end of the Cold War. We are seeing uh, the superpower, which had had such supreme hold over the international system, uh, no longer capable or willing uh, to play that role. And India's relationship with the United States was built at a time when that role was in full flourish. So I think there is a moment for Indian policymakers to also introspect on how it's going to adapt to what are structural changes. Uh, for one, we can see, and I think we see it in the Indian discourse by, by official statements by the foreign minister and others, and, and there's a clear attempt to uh, revive 
the precepts that have worked for India. So what are these precepts? Uh, an undiminished desire to preserve uh, India's independent, uh, autonomous geopolitical identity, as well as a tight control over the types of security policies that it would uh, project. Uh, a second, uh, we are seeing a much more purposeful commitment by policymakers in India to shape the economic system, the domestic industrial space, growth priorities. This is very different from the unipolar, new liberal phase, where it was seen to simply plug into globalization and you are sort of on your way to great power status. So there's a lot more, you could say, strategic industrial policies that have come into place, which will impact the Indo-US relationship. Uh, and then finally, I think uh. there is a, definitely a national commitment in India to preserve the organic evolution of India's, what you want to call it, civilizational, Indic, cultural ideas, without interference from external forces. I think that's a very new factor in Indian politics and uh, that is also going to have a role in how Indo-US relations evolve. So these are the core values and interests for India. And now, having established those, how does India-US relationship unfold in, in the next phase? I think that's the challenge. So I would suggest that we are see, going to see a more transactional relationship uh, with the US in the cards, regardless of uh, whoever emerges in the White House. Uh, I, I, it's clear that the U.S. across its domestic system does see India's rise as useful and beneficial, but it there is no longer the sense of geopolitical empathy and altruism that we saw in the discourse in the mid 2000s when India's rise was seen as positive in it in itself, regardless of what India chose to do. I think the U.S. policymakers are getting far more transactional and short term in how they view it. And that's partly relating to their own uh, churning in how, uh, how they're going to recraft their security commitments and positions in different regions of the world. Uh, so key, po key challenge for India, I'll close by, is suggesting that I think India has a lot more agency in shaping this relationship. Because I think there's been a tendency that we will let the US side shape where we are going. But I think the roles have shifted. Uh, India's opportunities to script a positive but mature framework for a partnership with the US that is based on a sophisticated understanding of those domestic fissures in the US, as well as the serious challenges that the US establishment is now confronting in on a whole range of fronts, particularly this unfolding multipolar world, which India supports enthusiastically, but the US is anxious of. I think that's really changed the, uh, the, uh, the dynamic from 20 years ago. Uh, finally, last line, to alienate or abandon the US and thus the West is obviously unwise for India. But to place India's entire foreign policy framework into the whirlwind of US domestic politics and the existential crisis of US uh, international identity would be outright irresponsible for an Indian policymaker. Thank you. Thank you, Jorawal, for finishing within your time. Actually, we have left one minute. And you have raised so many questions. Will Arun will answer when it turn comes. Now I turn to Professor Chintamani Mahapatra. He will share a totally different perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for this opportunity. Uh, in this brief time, I'll try to raise just three questions and try to answer in my own, own way. Uh, number one is whether in the US, democracy is under big challenge. When you open Washington Post, there is a little write-up every day. It says, democracy dies in darkness. I would not say that there is political darkness in the US, but certainly a certain amount of muddiness is there. It is getting muddier by the day. Now, many, many academics in the US, commentators, professors are writing books and articles and commentaries. And uh, Robert Kagan recently wrote a big essay, big debate, saying Donald Trump's dictatorship is inevitable. Let's not pretend. Right? That's because the Americans are watching how a gentleman who is charged 91 times in violating rules, regulations, and laws, who is facing four criminal cases, is getting stronger politically. In a way, Donald Trump has captured the Republican Party. In a way, he has now captured the Republican National Convention. He is going to appoint a lot of officials, 60 plus, who are going to be the loyalists and all. And the way Republican Party has been almost bought over by Donald Trump, 
and you don't have a single voice within that party who can challenge whatever he says. When Donald Trump says that if the NATO member countries don't pay us, then I'll ask Russia to do whatever they want to do. Not a single voice within the Republican Party challenged that. When a presidential candidate like Donald Trump says that the immigrants are nothing but poison in the American blood, nobody challenged within the party. So at the moment, Donald Trump actually is trying his best to come to power yet again. And if he does that, probably the second president in American history would do that. The former president again contesting and winning the election. This time, full preparation is going on. Quite a few think tanks, his own boys, and very skillful commentator, commentators and scholars are working on if Donald Trump wins the election, what kind of transition would take place, who would take charge, what should be done, what is their agenda is very clear. So when Ambassador Surendra Kumar asked me, is there going to be a bloodbath if he loses the election, there are many people think that when he was the president and he believed, I don't know whether he believed or not, he said so many, many times the election has been stolen. We all saw what happened on 6th of January 2021. And the way Donald Trump has been getting politically stronger and stronger, there are many people who say, in case he loses the election, will there be another chance that this election yet again has been stolen? Will there be another insurrection in the Capitol Hill? If not in the Capitol Hill, elsewhere, will there be a lot of violence? Very unlikely that the US is going to go, go for a civil war kind of thing after Donald Trump, if he loses the election. I don't think so, because the American system is in place and a lot of steps will be taken. But the real question is whether there is, there is going to be a bloodbath if he wins the election. And what kind of bloodbath? Here we are not talking about shedding of the blood. But if you borrow a term that is used in the stock market about the bloodbath, then in that case you can see a lot of changes within the American domestic situation where people are worried about it. For example, in education, Donald Trump's agenda says that if I win the election, the college principals will be elected by the parents. There will be military fellows who will be security guard in the schools so that there, there will be no, no violence there. He has his own agenda even in uh, you know, starting prayer as well as um, patriotism in American schools. About the immigration, they are really terrified. The immigrants think that if he thinks that we are the poison in the blood, and Donald Trump openly saying, I am going to start deporting all these fellows, and those who are illegal immigrants, and they have children, they are not going to be given automatically citizenship. There are concerns about the immigrants there. Then, this way, within the American society, even the economic situation is going to change in a very big way. It is Trump and Trumpian economy which is going to come back. There will be tax cut, and he will try his best to protect all those fellows who have been charged and put behind the bars right now. He's going to protect them. Bigger danger is apparently, reportedly, he wants to dismantle the deep state. He's trying to, he's going to reform the bureaucracy where he's going to employ people at higher official level, not from the bureaucracy directly who, has, who have come from the civil service examination, but by political loyalist. We all know about the spoil system in the US at the higher level. But if he's going to change the bureaucracy and go after even uh, FBI and all those deep state, it is going to be some kind of disruption, a kind of bloodbath within the US. And the next question would be, if he wins the election, what will happen in the rest of the world? I think this is the first election in, in modern American history or history of the world where many, many countries, both allies and foes of the United States, are very anxiously watching what would happen if Trump would come back to power again. Whether the four years of Trump is going to be 2.0 and similar thing more expanded, or it is going to be transformative and he is going to shape the world in his new image, the kind of anger he has, the kind of frustration he has, what kind of policy is going to adopt towards NATO, for example? Transatlantic partners within Europe, they're really worried about a Trump coming back to power because Trump in its own agenda has very clearly said, will think about continuing in NATO. It is not going to be easy for him. There is Congress, there is judiciary, and in fact, in Congress, there is already a law. If the US would withdraw from NATO, it, it would require even congressional approval. It's not going to be easy, but there are questions. Is he going to end the war in Ukraine in 24 hours? 
before it even uh, is inaugurated we don't know but this is the guy who was so comfortable so comfortable with the dictators north korean or the chinese or the russians and what kind of relationship is going to evolve between the us and all these dictators we don't know yet right and a lot of questions about taiwan the taiwanese feel very comfortable whether trump or joe biden not going to make any difference but other countries in the region are worried about what is going to happen in taiwan if chinese take really action is trump going to be keeping quiet or is going to be more muscular in that because it was trump who restored quiet which was almost buried for 10 years is going to take it forward is trump going to support and back imac and uh, imf is he going to continue the quiet or he wants to change it these are big questions that are that are being raised everywhere the last question is about india uh, i by and large agree with uh, ambassador kumar when he says that we, we need not worry much and that is true if you go by history and the behavior of donald trump and the relationship he cultivated with india particularly prime minister modi nothing much is to be worried about but during that time after all he did not impose sanctions on india because of s400 when he came to india there were two summits with prime minister modi when he came to india 3 billion dollars of uh, arms deal with india so although on the economic matters were a lot of problem he took he took india out of the gps list and of course he imposed a lot of tariff we retaliated and he would certainly try to push india to open the market further all those things are going to happen but it has not affected indo us defense and security ties so at the moment when the whole world order is under challenge russia and china are coming together north korea is more powerful than before you know, when trump was in power in last four years north korea has tested so many uh, icbm and all kinds of missiles and nuclear things so the world order is in a kind of flux uh, th- there is no order in this kind of situation a mercurial person unpredictable person coming to the white house how he is going to maintain order in the world is it really going to be completely isolationist don't care what is going on elsewhere in the world i'll focus on indian sorry american economy only american economy how to make money or is he going to really intervene when there is a war raging on in west asia we don't know how it is going to unfold and when the ukraine war is going on we don't know how he is going to sort it out and end it lots of questions are there in that kind of situation how india is going to navigate in its relations with the us is not going to be easy but it is important that we start thinking about it the possibilities or you know, what 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 may happen and if things go wrong how to tackle that thank you for your attention thank you professor you have uh, painted very doomsday scenario many worrying questions i think things may not be so bad let us hope for the best and look we have handled nixon henry kissinger we can handle donald trump also and we can also remember how de modi and we can remember what happened one and a half let people welcoming him in ahmedabad and all the walks in the taj mahal so i think we will certainly try to find ways and means of dealing with them now i will i know economic relations are really fundamental any country relations and i think we can't find better person than dr bhalla who has been in washington and uh, he has been here also in prime minister economics advisory council so i will turn to dr sujit bhalla before that let me formally welcome the new secretary is for mea dr bhalla thank you very much um you know there is an easy part to the question uh, easy answer to the question you have posed and then there is a slightly more difficult answer but i'll try and do both of them and maybe even encroach a little bit on mahapatra's territory uh on the election because um that's a big hobby of mine and i did get the 2016 us election quite wrong um so maybe now is the time for me to make up for that um look regarding the economy what is you know in the, i don't think there's ever been a time when india and the us were more alike um let me expand 
the U.S. is today the fastest growing major economy in the industrialized world, the advanced world. India is the fastest growing economy in the rest of the world. So if we take out the advanced countries, we are by far. Um, just today, half an hour ago, the U.S. data again came out uh, as far as the economy is concerned. And they're growing at about three, three and a half percent, whereas Europe, Japan, etc., are hardly growing. And we know India is growing at something close to eight percent, and the rest of um, the developing countries are not doing so well. <clears throat> so there's a great um, similarity there. Both societies are extremely polarized. Um, that also is, but as far as polarization is concerned, I don't think any country in the world uh, is not polarized at present. Um, you can thank social media, uh, you can thank globalization, but um, there is, and if anything, the U.S. is even more polarized than India. Um, so, will <coughs> India's economic relations be impacted by whoever comes out? Um, I don't think so at all. Um, I think uh, we are peace in a pod. We have very good relationship. We will have our differences. We will call the ambassadors in and tell them they're talking nonsense. And, um, and I think it will all continue. So that's more for the public. As far as the relations goes, um, we are in a very, very strong place as far as the relation. And, you know, Clinton, after all, said, uh, which was in 1992, it is the economy stupid. And I think that's going to be uh, the reason, and I'll come to the forecast now, um, both for the U.S. as well as for India. Um, the economy will determine the election. One additional point, and, and you know, as I said, the U.S. economy has surprised everybody. Um, they, um, you know, <clears throat> Trump thought he had um, got the economy going again. To a certain extent, that is correct. But all the data now points to that the U.S. economy, uh, notwithstanding their Boeings and their uh, their bridges is in very, very good shape <clears throat> and it will determine. So I want to add a dimension um, to, so basically much ado about, not much ado about nothing, but I don't think our relationship with the, my primary uh, topic was whether the relation would be affected, not at all, regardless who comes in. Now I'll come to who I think would come in. Um, and it's for the same reason um, I had argued in 2016 that Hillary Clinton will win the election because of the women's vote. It turned out, if you recall, that Hillary Clinton got about a 3% excess vote. It was 25 to 3% more than Trump, and it was these four or five states, or not three or four states, that tilted because of this strange thing called the Electoral College. This time, it's going to be the woman's vote again. And I think that's going to tip the balance in favor of Biden. Both are very old. Um, and in, in many ways, Trump is a lot more unstable um, than Biden is. But the women's vote, and I would attribute the women's vote primarily to the anti-abortion laws that were passed in the U.S. Um, that played, I think, a strong role or big role in the congressional elections and will continue uh, to play a role in the presidential election. For an election junkie, I, you know, I don't think there's ever been a time uh, when following elections has been so much fun and so interesting. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Varla. You have painted much more promising future for us and for the U.S. And I'm sure Biden's <laughs> supporter must be 
Thank you. They are listening to you. I will turn to now General Deepak Kapoor. As you know, if you look back at relations between India and the U.S., if you start from 1971, you can't recognize the same country with which we have now $25 billion of defense trade going on. We have now joint research and now talking about transfer technology and jet engines and all that. So I think this has been phenomenal progress in the field of defense and security. And we can't find a better person to enlighten us than General Deepak Kapoor. Over to you. Thank you, Ambassador Sundar Kumar. Mm -hmm. Let me start by saying that we need to look at the current geopolitical realities uh, before we take a considered view of where we spend, stand defense-wise vis-a-vis the United States of America, considering especially the fact that we've had a very close relationship with Russia for as long as since independence, close to about 77 odd years. So let me first touch on the U.S. perspective in the current geopolitical era. Yes, the U.S. has moved away from that earlier philosophy that if you are not with us, you are against us. There has been a change. That is one part. But there is also the fact that the rise of China in the second half of the 20th century is basically attributable to the Nixon-Kissinger era. And that is how the Chinese were helped all along in being where they are today. So which is uh, what is going to be hurting because with the growth of the Chinese economy and it becoming stronger, the urge to expand aggressively has also gone up. And that has gone up tremendously if you notice uh, from the beginning of the 21st century onwards, it's gone up tremendously. So, and it's gone up both at the regional as well as at the global level. At the regional level, we are all aware of their efforts to push beyond the Himalayas. We are ourselves part of that scenario. We also have expansionism being undertaken both in the South China Sea as well as the East China Sea. The threat to Taiwan, which has always been there, but it's becoming more and more actively aggressive as time passes. And finally, the establishment of uh, some kind of a military infrastructure in the garb of trade and whatever else you say, in the various islands in South China Sea, like Spratly and others. And therefore, that's why you find the Philippines also smarting under the Chinese expansionism. Uh, that is very much there. At the global level, we are quite clear that the Chinese are expanding both towards the Indian Ocean as well as towards the Pacific Ocean. And no one is more aware of it than the U.S. In all this, uh, we also need to concede the fact that India is the only country that has withstood the, uh, in fact, the direct attempted at expansion, expansionism by China. All other countries, you see all the countries in South China Sea, have by and large tried to stick to the uh, the argument that the law of the seas favors them, therefore the Chinese should not expand. But that doesn't, hasn't stopped China from expanding. But we have physically faced them. We've also been subjected to a certain amount of, uh, I would say, a loss of territory in the Ladakh region. But still, today we have a situation, there are close to about 50 to 60,000 troops deployed on both sides of the line of actual control in the Ladakh region itself. And I'm not talking about the central sector or the northeast uh, in Ar Arunachal Pradesh, etc. Now, let me talk a little about the Indian perspective. I think the basic tenet that we have always followed is the aspect of strategic autonomy, and we have maintained it. Whether when we've been close to Russia or with the Americans, throughout we've maintained that through the 50s when 
the Pakistanis are closer to Seattle and Centro, etc., and beyond. Uh, it's not necessary that everyone's going to be liking that, especially when you've had a policy of, if you're not with us, you're against us. So it takes time to adjust. The other aspect is that I mentioned earlier that 77 years of close defense relationship with Russia cannot be wished away. While we talk about closer cooperation, whether with Biden presidency or the Trump presidency, the fact is that just about 10 years back, we were dependent to the extent of 70 to 80 percent of, of our equipment, the military equipment, being of Russian origin. If in the last 10 years it has come down, it has still come down to a figure something like 60 to 70 percent. So, uh, and therefore, what I'm trying to uh, suggest to this audience is that this change which has happened in 10 years has been over a, over a percentage of something like 10 percent of the equipment. And for any substantial change to happen, it may take anything like a couple of more decades. Because uh, the military equipment needs to be adapted, there is a tremendous amount of uh, resistance to part with, a part with uh, high level technology for military equipment. When the uh, people who part with it, they do, they expect tremendous amount of costs, which at times, uh, sometimes the country can't afford, at other times, uh, policy-wise, the giver countries do not wish to part with it. So both ways it works. That's why from an Indian perspective, it's, it's going to take time. And it cannot be overnight, unlike things like trade or economic relations, which you can perhaps change over a short period of time. Uh, India has also been particularly careful in not getting involved in a security relationship uh, as far as China is concerned. So that is why you find that the, the focus of Quad is on all other matters and 2 plus 2 dialogues is on all other matters but security. And that is what impelled the U.S. to go in for an AUKUS type of relationship that is Australia, U.S. and U.K. So India has to play with that because it's a frontline state is the one which has withstood the Chinese expansionism. So therefore, it has to go along and worry about this aspect. The other aspect which is of concern to India is that of a two-front threat. Considering the kind of close relationship between China and Pakistan, we are fully aware what kind of a threat we face. And please don't forget that the Chinese defense expenditure or military expenditure, shall I say, officially, is about three and a half times ours on an annual basis, and it has been so for the last 25 to 30 years. The, uh, on the western side, Pakistan, while it is supposed to have a very uh, meek economy, major problems, but the, back, uh, the rulers in the background are the military, and they take whatever they decide to take for the growth of their military. So from both those perspectives, and please also remember that the Indian military budget for the last uh, 10 years has actually, as a percentage of the GDP, fallen from approximately 2% to about approximately 1.47% today. And I'm sure Mr. Bhalla will bear me out to that. Well, uh, the... U.S. is also technologically, military-wise, far too ahead of us. And, of course, we would be happy, especially with a two-front threat, to be closer to the U.S. Uh, to help us. But they would also be very careful about what they part with and how are we able to actually absorb all that. So it's going to be a time-consuming process. It may happen. And it, but it's, like I said earlier, it may take a couple of decades for it to actually happen fully. So therefore, where does it leave us and the effect of the U.S. presidency? We've had the privilege of having Trump earlier for four years. We have uh, Biden here today. 
and for the last three years and completing this period by November, four years. So as far as uh, President Biden is concerned, I suppose it will be safe to say that the same policies will continue. And despite talk of all, all sorts of strategic partnership, it never stopped the U.S. from uh, talking to India about the, uh, the Panun probe. It never stopped the U.S. to start talking about the Niger murder. It never stopped the U.S. from talking about Kejriwal's arrest or anyone else's arrest within the system. So therefore, this kind of, while we talk about cooperation, uh, will continue, but this kind of a relationship is going to continue over a period of time. Uh, Trump win will will somehow be almost similar, but uh, in 2018, Trump had declared India as a tier one status. In 2020, they had approved military sales worth about $25 billion, which included 30 UAV, dro uh, predator, UAV and predator drones, etc. But uh, if you notice, Trump is more of a businessman and he conducts relationships even at the presidential level with that business-like attitude. And that is why he demanded of all the European members in, of NATO to start spending approximately 2% of their GDP for the defense of Europe. And uh, again, that is the kind of a philosophy he would follow if he has to get clo uh, have a closer friendship with Russia, uh, India in terms of having a question of give and take. And it perhaps is not going to be a one-sided uh, assistance or help from the U.S. altogether. But we do need this kind of um, a close relationship because of the kind of uh, security situation we are going to be exposed to. Okay. <coughs> uh, there are lots of common interests, and therefore the ties are likely to grow, but it will be a, a, a period of time before they grow fully. So I don't, in the overall context, expect much of a change when the presidency changes in the U.S. Thank you. Thank you, General Kapoor, for giving defense perspective. I'm sure those who are listening, they will convey to right places that our defense budget should increase. <coughs> Dr. Bhalla has the right connections to convey there. Yeah. Now, Arun has been listening, MS Arun Kumar Singh has listening very patiently, and he's the right person to answer all the queries and all the doubts, uncertainties which have been painted. And at the end of the day, we'll present a more positive picture. Over to you, Arun. Uh, thank you. So let me first say that I broadly agree with all that has been said. So, uh, <clears throat> when the 2016 election uh, that uh, Professor Vallah also spoke about was taking place, uh, at that time I was still ambassador there, but I left before Trump got elected. Uh, so I did go to the two conventions, both the Republican and Democratic convention, as this is the norm. And at the Republican convention, very senior Republicans were saying that it's so unfortunate that we are nominating the one candidate who could lose to a Hillary Clinton. <laughs> but we are very happy that the Democrats are going to nominate the one candidate who could lose to a Donald Trump. And I think today we are in a similar situation that the Republicans are going to nominate the one candidate who can lose to Joe Biden. And many Democrats believe that if you had a candidate other than Joe Biden, uh, then Trump would have been defeated very easily. So, it, it, so we are faced with a situation uh, where uh, what uh, Professor Bhalla said uh, uh, about one segment of your society is true, but still nobody knows who is going to win. There's a phase of uncertainty. And also nobody knows what either of them will do after winning the election. Now, I remember uh, again during the Trump campaign in 2016, when he was very strongly criticizing allies, you know, that they are uh, milking the U.S., he was spending too much. Then there were people who were doing advocacy for India uh, who said, who were talking to the campaign, that if that is so, then India is your best partner. Because India is not an ally. You are not spending money on India. You don't have military bases in India. Uh, so what India is asking for is build a partnership based on trade and technology cooperation.
for which you will benefit, India will benefit. And a strong India, uh, even if it is not necessarily pro-US, even if it is not necessarily anti-China, especially in the security domain, a strong India in itself will be a natural deterrent to China's unilateral and aggressive positions. And therefore, it is useful also uh, for the US. So that was the kind of talk going around at that time. Now, from there, if I uh, clearly, under, in both administrations, the overall relationship has been on a positive trajectory. Uh, but if we go deeper into specific areas, in some, it was a steady growth uh, from one to the other. In the others, it was sort of waxed and waned. Uh, on the technology side, as General Kapoor mentioned, uh, the Obama administration in 2016 declared India a major defense partner. And the one reason they did that was that they wanted to be able to authorize higher level technology cooperation with India, including in defense. And uh, in India's case, India did not fit into any category. We are not a NATO ally. Uh, we are not a non-NATO ally. So they had to create a new category for India to allow higher level technology releases. Trump built on that and did uh, strategic Trade Authorization Level 1, uh, the placement for India, which in principle allowed India same level of technology releases as the US allowed to its NATO partners. And the Biden administration has taken that even one notch higher by doing uh, launching in January last year this initiative on critical and emerging technologies, yeah, artificial intelligence, quantum, biotech, cyber, 6G, semiconductors, space, defense, and when they had done it with India, they had not launched that kind of cooperation with any of their other partners. With European countries, they did later, and they did in specific areas, AI or quantum, but not overall. And the next country with which they'd launched such an overall partnership was with South Korea in December last year. And in that launch, it is mentioned that India, US, and ROK will now have a trilateral cooperation framework for uh, the uh, critical and emerging technologies. And from reports that came out, the first meeting at a functional level was held um, a couple of weeks ago. So on that, they moved certainly in a certain way. But then from there, if we look at the Pakistan-Afghanistan dimension, uh, there's been a bit of zigzag on both sides. Uh, when Trump came in, uh, in 2017, July, he, he made a major policy statement on South Asia because they wanted to define what would be their policy uh, related to Afghanistan. And in that, he was very critical of Pakistan for uh, you know, uh, making it difficult for the US to achieve its objectives. And as a way of you know, putting pressure on Pakistan, he said India should do more in Afghanistan. Uh, and that, that would be the US approach. Then if you remember in January, 1st January 2018, at 3 AM US time, he tweeted that Pakistan has been hoodwinking us taking money from us, not giving us support, stop all aid to Pakistan. And for a while, they stopped all aid to Pakistan. So that was there. Then in July 2019, he welcomes Imran Khan in the White House uh, because by then they are now trying to start an agreement with the Taliban, process of an agreement, and want Pakistan to help them get into an agreement with the Taliban. So in July 2019, he welcomes Imran Khan in the White House. And in response to a planted question, he says, that he's ready to mediate on Kashmir. And not only that, that the Indian Prime Minister has asked him to do mediation on Kashmir. Now, this is simply not possible. So here is a head of state not constrained by facts in terms of what he says publicly. And the Indian External Affairs Minister, very in, within a couple of days, had to make a statement in Parliament that there is no truth to what the US President has said. So there is that waxing, and you have to be prepared for that, um, that uh, Trump would be driven by what he sees as his immediate interest, immediate compulsion, and then uncertainty flowing from that. And if we look at Biden, at one level, uh, Biden was pushing since 2009 for the US to withdraw from Afghanistan. When Obama took the decision at the military advice to ratchet up number of troops, but then say 18 months timeline to draw down, Biden was pushing that you withdraw right away. He was saying that the military is boxing you in, that you know we cannot achieve uh, success in Afghanistan beyond a point. You have to get out. So once he became president, he sees what Trump had done. 
and continued with the withdrawal and left in August. So when they decided to withdraw, they clearly factored in their interest. Biden's political interest, his political assessment, of course, it played out in a difficult way for him. Uh, but they didn't factor in necessarily what would be India's concerns or impact on India, because they will take decisions in their interest, and we have to uh, you know, try to pr protect our interests within the framework of that. And with Pakistan, for example, the Biden administration has offered a $450 million sustainment package for the F-16. Of course, the argument is that it's only a sustainment package uh, to maintain their efficiency, not to enhance their capacity. But if you're maintaining efficiency, you're in, in effect also enhancing capacity. Uh, but still, it's not like what the Obama administration had tried to do in February 2016, when they had authorized 18 F-16 aircraft uh, for Pakistan. And it was only through lobbying in U.S. Congress that that deal uh, was blocked. So, so we have to be prepared that they will be looking at issues, including Afghanistan, Pakistan, from their perspective, and we have to work for India's interests. Final point that I'll make uh, would be uh, on China, that uh, there again, there has been waxing waning from uh, both. Trump came in very strong on China uh, because the message was the 40-50% of the U.S. population that felt they had lost out with the globalization that their income stagnated, uh, wage rates uh, came down, death rates went up, longevity came down, drug addiction went up, who were voting for Trump uh, because they believed that China had sucked away manufacturing. So he came down very strong on trade with China, on tariffs related to China. And yet in July 2019, in a conversation with President Xi at the margins of G20, as reported by his national security advisor, John Bolton, uh, Trump said, why don't you buy more from the Midwest states? Because that will help me in the elections. And if that helps me in the elections, you know, I'll look at the issues related to China uh, somewhat differently. And in January 2020, he did, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of an initial um, uh, short-term agreement with China, preliminary agreement with China on trade. And it was a strange sight for a country which is very strict in protocol terms, that the president of the US is signing an agreement with a vice premier of China in the White House. And the president in the meeting are the US vice president and several cabinet officials. Uh, because again, he's looking at getting that trade deal to show that he'll get more purchase from the Midwest, which will hopefully help him in the elections. So, so th that kind of dealing to keep in mind your particular uh, political interest is something we have to be prepared for. And finally, uh, on the issue of trade, Trump was, that was one area that was very negative towards us, very, despite the overall positive trajectory, imposing tariffs and steel and aluminum imports from India, ostensibly on national security ground. Can I take half a please, minute? Please, please, please. Ostensibly on national security grounds, publicly deriding the Indian Prime Minister uh, for not lowering tariffs on Harley Davidson. Um, and, but here, the Biden administration, while they have not been able to restore the GSP, but they have withdrawn uh, all complaints that US and India have filed against at each other at WTO. And if you look at the joint statements coming now out of trade policy forum meetings, um, even though there's no specific market access capture, the tone of the joint statements is very, very positive that will work in this area, identify further areas of cooperation. And when I asked a senior official as to why this change in tone, and the answer was that it is because a geostrategic shift has happened. And our leaders have told the teams to make the relationship work, and they're putting an effort to make the relationship work also on trade and economic issues. So that's the scenario we are facing. And I broadly agree with you, sir, that whoever wins, I think we should do well. Thank you. Let us give a big hand to our panelists. I think this has been more informative, more enriching than what you would have seen on television, which is still be talking about where is demonstration, where is ED, where is... He. <laughs> now, before I open the floor for questions, if the panelists want to ask each other anything, you are welcome. Any one of you? You are all in agreement. Professor Mahapatra. I have one question to General Saab. Uh, you know, NATO was formed uh, to contain, counter the former Soviet Union. And uh, there has been never any war between NATO and uh, Russia or the former Soviet Union. 
Uh, there has never been any big direct war between any major powers of, uh, you know, uh, Security Council, five permanent members and all. Russia and China are together for some reason. It's known to all. So in this kind of scenario, if Russia and China are together, and China and Pakistan are together, you talked about the danger in this kind of security scenario. Are we going to lose anything just by signing an agreement with the US for a deeper relationship? That's a very good question, Professor Mahapatra. But the fact is, if you wish to, and you have continued to ensure that you'd like to retain your strategic autonomy, therefore, you do not wish to be seen very close to either bloc. As far as NATO was concerned, post Second World War, you found that communist Russia was on a different wavelength vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the rest of Europe. And that is how NATO was born and was supported totally and wholeheartedly by the US. In the present context, India is a frontline state. While it is okay to be close to the West. It's good. But when it push comes to shove, I think we are the ones who are going to be affected the most. And therefore, perhaps there is wisdom in continuing to retain that kind of strategy of autonomy. And while you say that Russia and China have grown, grown closer together, they are. Yes, but then uh, we've also tried to ensure that in all this turmoil and all these sanctions which have been put on Russia, we are still doing business with them. We are trying to sustain that. And we are also ensuring that since our military equipment, like I mentioned, is something in the region about 60 to 65 percent Russian, we are still dependent a lot on them. So therefore, even if this kind of a thing that you are talking about, closer relationship, it may come over a period of time once you have been able to transform your equipment from the present profile to something different. But as of now, as of today, and in the current scenario of the Biden stroke Trump presidency, I don't think that's going to happen. So it's going to take time, especially when it military matters are concerned. The foreign powers are very chary of giving very high technology uh, uh, equipment to you, and you need to develop some of your own. You're also trying to make sure that you have a Make in India concept, which a large number of countries are not prepared to give. In fact, you can literally count on fingertips the kind of make in India technology that you've been able to acquire. The last I heard was that only one country as of now, Sweden, has come up with a rocket launcher, which is likely to be uh, launched. And of course, we also hear about Boeing uh, talking about uh, aircraft being manufactured. But it's going to take time. And post-introduction, trials, and thereafter, Gestation period required for the uh, the military to absorb all that. So it's a time-consuming process. Okay, thank you, thank you General. I don't want to chip in. No. Okay, now floor is open. Anybody? Chief editor of Sunday Guardian. I have a, I have a question. Um, the thing is, you see, <clears throat> at times it seems like um, the different U.S. departments they are working in silos. Uh, would you say? Ambassador Singh, it's a specific question to you since the thing is that would you say that sometimes the State Department and as is working at cross purposes with the other departments and as a result of which at least to outsiders like us, it seems like there is no whole of government approach towards foreign relations when it comes to India and I'm certain with other countries. Is that the case? So I think it is widely known that uh, different departments in the U.S. system uh, do have their own way of arriving at a decision and pursue that decision. And th they do work in silos uh, to a significant extent. But the whole of government approach is ensured by the National Security Council. That's how the system works. So when they want a whole of government approach, for example, if you look at the initiative on critical and emerging technologies, for all the, uh, sorry? Sorry. It's for, uh, from all the reports that have come out, uh, it, it, there was tremendous opposition, uh, not just in state, but many other uh, areas. But it was the White House that pushed it through that it must be done. This is the direction in which we want to take the relationship. 
so yeah it's it's well known uh, part of their system so eventually if you want to drive that whole of government approach you have to get the national security council on your side and it is because of the icit initiative that we got the clearance for the g414 engine air uh, transfer technology production technology otherwise it wouldn't have happened and that was also a process driven by the national security council ura bagay please you see uh, the us military industrial complex is continuing to cause a problem all over the world are we going to encouraging are we going to encourage it by cooperating more with it and less with russia and also we are now doing atmanirbhar which is a very good thing but now we want to export weapons so are we going to help weaponize the world uh, that is one and number two as far as our founder goes uh, mahatma gandhi he wanted peace in the world but what have we achieved with our nuanced approach on israel and ukraine have we achieved any movement towards peace or we just go on talking about autonomy strategic autonomy listen so we are in the context of the theme of the discussion you have too many things from gandhi to ukraine to whatever peace and all that so i don't know which maybe limited part of um, your question can be addressed by panelists <laughs> okay. which part of the question <laughs> so i'll only say this that as i understand it india engages with the defense industry of the us based on its assessment of its own interest what we need to buy and many of the platforms that we have for example the c17s which a long haul enabled us to move troops very quickly uh, to the line of actual control in 2020 without which we would not have been able or the pati the maritime reconnaissance aircraft is enabled us to get intelligence uh, on the seas including in interdiction for piracy which we are we are doing it and we have eva- evacuated large number of indians in difficult situation and again there the c17 c130s have been used so i think uh, as i see the indian side has engaged with these keeping in mind our interest and whatever else they may be doing okay go ahead yeah mr singh last time prime minister modi campaigned for trump do you think we can also reciprocate we can allow them to campaign for any party in india <laughs> no no but uh, <laughs> he never come i think uh, <laughs> as i saw it he did not he was not campaigning for anyone at that speech if you really look at it carefully let me just stop no let us not degrade the discussion to those kind of things we have a very serious discussion if you have very sort of a focus question ask otherwise yes dr rao he is a senior supreme court advocate and so many other organizations under him uh, i'm also vice president of the indian society of international law so uh, i'm going to uh, you know give my perception and comment on that and i would like you to react i i, I feel comment very brief yeah very brief one minute very all right one minute now i i clearly see the election tilted clearly in favor of trump for a couple of reasons especially the ukraine war uh, situation in israel uh america Are you local... to bet on this huh <laughs> yes yeah Prepare. you want to wager that will do after the after the after the my my uh, my comment uh i see that and uh, on the previous election he narrowly i mean made it there and he made the comment that his election was robbed etc and the politics were there and i personally feel he may have won the last election as well so now now given the situation that america feels this degraded position of its international uh, you know role and it also uh, you know uh, you know uh, is is uh, perhaps not so uh, comfortable in its relations with europe etc the general perception in the us would be that trump is a stronger man biden is an older man who has not been able to do his uh, bit and his leadership is waning uh, as a strong leader which america loves so it's tilted in that favor first point second point uh, as we also are there in election there was a great bonhomie between uh, trump and uh, modi 
And uh, today's India, uh, if, if either of any one of them wins, is a different India 20, of 2024 as G20 leadership, etc. So therefore, I say that we will be in a stronger relationship post-elections, uh, the US elections, and Trump is clearly going to be the winner. Thank you. Trump supporters must be happy with your statement. Don't for, you talked about G20. You talked about G20. Don't forget your consensus statement would not have happened but for Biden. Not necessarily. I mean, yeah. Yes, please. Good evening. I, I would like some comment from on my side. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, my question is addressed to Ambassador Singh. Uh, as everybody, even a con person, is aware that India US relations and India uh, Pakistan relations is intertwined. And they have got a separate metrics which, which plays out in practice. With recent developments in Afghanistan and Pakistan, how they are going to play out in this term, whosoever wins, either Mr. Trump or Mr. Biden, how it is going to play it out. As we have seen that India experienced, uh, had, has got a very bad experience regarding how US handled Afghanistan and they left and India were in doldrums. And they had to face a lot of challenges getting out their people from there without any information. In fact, uh, uh, US people, they left. Okay. So in my assessment, uh, Pakistan is only one of the factors that impacts on India-US relations. Uh, the other important factors are first, what is the global priority US has set it for itself at a point of time? Then within the framework of that priority, what is the role it sees for Pakistan? Because then that impacts on us. Third, within the framework of its global priority and interest, what is the role it sees for China? Because that impacts on us. And finally, what is the strength of the bilateral relationship? Trade, investment, technology, defense, diaspora. Because that determines the stakeholders in the US system invested in the India relationship. So all these factors play. Now, as far as Pakistan is concerned, clearly at this stage, after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, Pakistan has less salience as influence on the U.S. as far as the India-U.S. Uh, relationship is concerned, but not zero salience because the U.S. still needs Pakistan to be able to access Afghanistan for its over drones to overfly Pakistan, reach Afghanistan for counterterrorism purposes. So that requirement is there. You have seen, uh, and then again for counterterrorism cooperation, in the broader Afghanistan-Pakistan region, they still need to be able to talk to the Pakistani leadership. And then the Americans argue publicly that Pakistan has nuclear weapons. And they need to be able to talk to the leaders of a country that have nuclear weapons. Because otherwise it can uh, create instability which would be adversarial to US interests. So from that perspective, they will have a certain need to engage with Pakistan dialogue with Pakistan. But the change that I see that has happened in the last 15-20 um, years is that while earlier, whenever they did things with India, they also tried to figure out how will it impact on the Pakistan relationship. That has changed. Now, whenever they do anything with Pakistan, they try and see how will it impact on the India relationship. Shouldn't impact negatively. So, so there will be a dimension, but I don't think that should uh, really worry us at this stage unless some dramatic transformation happens in the broader uh, regional geopolitical situation. Thank you, Arun. Thank you. We can take one more question. Yes, please. Take the mic. Can you just introduce yourself, please? Uh, Sensei Raj, founder Global Change Makers Network. My question is in the geopolitical context. <clears throat> no matter who wins, um, except possibly if Trump comes into, as you already stated, um, Mr. Singh, with whom I've already met you, from, I think, 2015, if I'm not. Now, what role does the U.S. has in terms of its waning reputation and credibility in the geopolitical context, and of course, in the territory as well? And what role specifically do you see India playing, regardless of who comes? And of course, whether it's Biden or Trump, or I think Trump, who shoots from his hip, we all know. Um, in that context, what would you specifically say? And then, of course, the, the secondary um, answer from the General Kapoor uh, from a strategic standpoint. So I rest my case. 
So, <clears throat> I think one can safely say that uh, uh, clearly the relative weight of the U.S. in the international system has declined somewhat. Uh, it, they are being challenged now by Russia in uh, Europe, uh, and um, the situation is seen as stalemate. They are being challenged by China in the broader Indo-Pacific, yeah. and they have not been able to do a real action against Chinese militarization in South China Sea. Uh, they have come out, U.S. has come out with repeated statements supporting Philippines uh, and saying that uh, they stand by their uh, military treaty and commitment to Philippines, but the Chinese continue to harass uh, Philippine ships trying to go to the second Thomas Shoal. So all that is there. But despite all this, U.S. remains the preeminent power. Uh, Russia has military strength, but doesn't quite have the economic and technological strength. Uh, China has economic, technological strength, but not yet uh, the military strength that the U.S. has. And if you look at allies and partners, the kind of allies and partners that the U.S. has, uh, Europe, uh, in Asia, Japan, ROK, Australia, uh, neither China or Russia have those partners. So the, despite this relative decline, the U.S. remains the preeminent power globally, and we have to see how that shift takes place. And if you look at India's comprehensive national interest, we have a very strong defense partnership with Russia, and General Kapoor also spoke about that. We have strong energy partnership with Russia, but the U.S. is our largest trading partner. U.S. is our largest investment partner. U.S. is the single uh, is the largest single country present of Indian origin diaspora. You have 300,000 Indian students in U.S. universities looking at the future. So with all this, uh, where our comprehensive national interest is concerned, U.S. remains a very, very strong partner for India. But given the nature of decision making, not just in U.S. and anywhere else, where they will take decisions based on their own interest, uh, as I think um, the General Kapoor mentioned, that you can't put all your eggs in one basket. So you have to hedge against that. And for India, the hedging partners are clearly at one level Russia and at another level France. Because in the broader Western system, France is another partner which has been now for some time very, very supportive of India, including in terms of defense cooperation. So I think, as I see, that's the strategy that India has been following to ensure that as it deepens various partnerships in its national interest, it is still able to maintain the autonomy of its decision making. Thank you, Arun. I will ask General Kapoor and then Professor Mahapatra and Dr. Valla all to chip in on this question. All to? Please. Add whatever. Uh, I'd only like to add that uh, over a period of time, we've seen that the U.S. is definitely a good partner, but uh, at times when push has come to shove, we have not had them coming forward, and it's not related to India alone. I say this because of what is happening in the South China Sea group of nations. And while they've said they support Philippines, for example, but nothing beyond that has happened. Uh, there's been some kind of threat to Taiwan. The uh, Chinese have uh, also established air defense identification zone in, tri in trying to ensure that people, uh, that no other aircraft fly anywhere close to Taiwan, etc., etc. So there are a number of instances when you find that while the U.S. in an overall context does support, well, it comes to an actual physical uh, combat. Will it be able to come forward? That is still open to question. That's why I'll leave it at that itself. Mahapatra, you want to add anything? Yeah. You see, today we don't see a unipolar world order, don't see a bipolar world order, don't see a multipolar world order. It is in flux. I don't think that today people are debating about the relative decline of the U.S. anymore. A new debate has started about the relative decline of China. All said and done, those who talk big about China, they make a list of all positive strengths of China, ignore the negativity is going on within China and its policy with many, many countries, including the debt crisis in the uh, global south. Secondly, all said and done about big talk, the United States maintains 700 military bases around the world. China, you can count them in your fingers. 
China is making new and new uh, aircraft carrier. The US, like it or not, still has 11 uh, aircraft carrier. The US still has hundreds of thousands of troops in the Indo-Pacific even now. How many Chinese troops are there abroad to maintain peace, stability? We, we all know very well. In every frontier of international affairs, the US is still the leader. When you talk about relative decline, all those things are very good academically. But in reality, the US still calls the shot. And that is important. That is why India's policy of strategic autonomy is really the key, the hedging strategy. And we have to realize that this is the reality and how best to navigate and protect our own interest. And within this, build up our own strength, which we have been doing over the years. Thank you. Thank you. You're our. So uh, one of the themes we haven't really addressed is uh, if a Trump administration comes in, what is the direct impact on India and on world order? I think one thing we can anticipate is if uh, Trump does enter the White House, it could lead to a lowering of this confrontation between the West and Russia and, uh, and a shift towards a little more balanced security policy. Uh, the, the reason I say that also is not just because the deep state in the US has this visceral ideological uh, Russophobia, which we see manifest. But I think uh, the Trump uh, administration, if it's truly going to create this domestic rejuvenation, economic growth, it needs uh, not necessarily a hostile relationship with China, but a more competitive and, and India there can be a partner as well. Uh, the other thing uh, it also does is because a Trump regime does not have a grand strategy of subduing every other state into an alliance system, it allows for more flexibility. It wants transactional relationships. I think that suits India because India is very much at home with a cherry picking parts of a relationship that it wants to pursue and not get into a securitized role, which has been addressed by uh, several of us. So on balance, a non-establishment, non-deep state uh, personality in the White House gives natural advantages to India's uh, geopolitical orientation and its geoeconomic orientation. Dr. Bhalla, you have the last word. Very briefly in one word that, <clears throat> or maybe a few words, but I, th I think there's a general tendency to overestimate China because of its rather remarkable record over the last 20, 30 years in economic growth. I think the biggest surprise from my vantage point um, on economic grounds, China is going to shock everybody by its weakening economic nature. To that extent, how it affects politics, all you guys are there and expert, but I'll only give my opinion on the economy, that China is not what it's thought to be, likely. Thank you. Once again, round of applause to our panelists. Thank you all for being such nice audience and hope to see you soon again. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>